All right. Well, I'm glad I'm teaching today, too. Kind of. <laughs> all right. Great to see all of you. Whether you have in front of you an actual one of these, <laughs> or you got your phone that has this on it, um, just just to reiterate this morning, have you ever t have you ever, have you taken any time lately to just think about how blessed we are to have the scriptures? Just amazing! It's an amazing thing that we have God's word and we have access to it, and we have you and I have access to it in ways, you know, that generations obviously before us have not had access to it. You can listen to it in your car, you can, you know, whatever. But I just have been kind of overwhelmed this week as we've gotten deeper and deeper into looking at Exodus. That God shows up at creation and he speaks the world into existence to reveal his word. That's what he's doing. And then he shows up in, in the flood to reveal his word. And then he shows up in the burning bush to do what? To reveal his word. And on and on and on it goes throughout the, the narrative of the Old Testament to reveal his word. And then, and then Jesus comes on the scene. And I always think it's tragic um, when people look at the Bible in a way that kind of, Jesus just popped up suddenly, <laughs> you know, out of nowhere. And and there are so many people that look at the Bible that way. When you teach the Bible over a lot of years, you run into ideas that people have about the Bible. And that's one of them. Like Jesus just shows up. And it's like, no. <laughs> God has been doing this the whole time. And then on that magnificent first Christmas Eve, the word takes on flesh and is born into our world. Because God is doing what? He's continuing to reveal his word. And then you and I get to be the recipients of the life and the blood of martyrs through the ages. And you and I can pick up this text. And now we have it in probably too many translations. But what a, what a treasure. And the fact that you and I get to get to, we get to gather every week and hear it and read it together as God's people and to learn it together as God's people. Amazing, amazing thing. So let's pray this morning and thank him for his word, shall we? Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us his word to live with us and to walk among us, and to continually speak to us. What an amazing treasure it is to have your word. And for that, we give you thanks this morning. Be with us as we open up the text of Exodus and help the teacher because he needs it. We thank you and praise you that you've given us this place and this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, if you look at your outline, you'll see at the top, Deliverance so far. If you remember a couple weeks ago, my first outline ended with just a little blurb that I wrote about the fact that God had begun to deliver his people, but he's just begun. He's just begun the task. And then Pastor, of course, brought us the wonderful narrative of the actual encounter with Moses in the burning bush last week. And um, it always takes me back to the movie The Ten Commandments when Charlton Heston goes up the mountain and then he comes back with a white streak in his hair. <laughs> I was thinking, man, what happened up there? He got coiffed up there at the burning bush, you know? So, um, but what an amazing encounter that is. And I, I think there's a danger for all of us as, as grown-ups to forget what a miraculous thing that is. <laughs> that Moses looks over and there's this bush and it's on fire and nothing's happening to it. And we hear that story from the time we're this size and we grow up with it and we say, oh yeah, that's just a burning bush story. <laughs> that's just the burning bush story. And a voice comes out of the bush, doesn't it? 
And you know, God could have said to Moses right there, don't want to have anything to do with you. You're sinful. Your people have continued to rebel against me. They complain, they whine, right? And God doesn't do that. God welcomes Moses. He says, take off your shoes, right? Why? Because the, the, the ground that you're on is holy ground. And in Scripture, feet are always a symbol of man's creatureliness. Okay? Even the angels in Isaiah 6, when it says that the cherubim have six wings, you know, and with two of their wings they cover their feet in the presence of the Lord. Why? Because they're creatures. It's a symbol of showing their, their reverence and their awe. And if the angels do that, right? The, the sinless angels, if they have that sense of wonder and awe in the presence of the Lord, how much more should you and, you and I have that? Amazing. Lots of great stuff today. So deliverance so far. We've seen up into the burning bush incident and, and God speaks to Moses and says, I want you to go to the people and tell them my name. We had that wonderful discussion last week. The name of the Lord. And I really, really, really want you to, to take up the discipline in your Old Testament reading of using God's personal name when you read. When you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, read Yahweh there. There's so many passages where it doesn't even really make sense to just use the word Lord because he's talking about his name. And we see that today. And so he gives him a charge to go to, the, to his people and tell him his name. And Moses says, what? I, I'm not a good speaker. <laughs> and then God says, well, you got a big brother. And I know he's got a speaking gift. So he teams him up with Aaron. And so you get this, this amazing pair that God puts together. I put on your outline the dynamic duo. But the two of them go and they address Pharaoh. And that question still exists that existed a couple weeks ago in our study. Who owns Israel? Who owns them? Pharaoh thinks he does, doesn't he? And, and Yahweh, he knows, right? And he's kind of letting this drama play out. But that's still a question through those first 14 or, or so chapters. The next thing there, it just says revelation through word and signs. We got that last week, didn't we? Where God speaks to Moses, but he also backs it up, doesn't he? With signs, with a staff turning to a snake. And with Moses putting his hand in his cloak and pulling it out and it's leprous, right? And then he puts it back in and pulls it out and it's like a baby's bottom, you know, it's new skin. And then he, t and he tells Moses to pour out water and it turns to what? Blood. So what's the equivalent today? Because God's methodology hasn't changed. We don't have word and sign so much as we talk about what, as New Testament believers, word and sacrament. But the sacraments are miracles. The sacraments are miracles. Every bit as much as the staff turning to a snake. Every bit. If you were here this morning and you took communion, what did you take in? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe better question. Who did you take in? Right? It's a miracle. Holy baptism is a miracle. It's not just something we go through. A little splash of water, a few words. Baby's good. Adult's good. No, 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 no. Those are miracles. There's another miracle that happens every Sunday. You and I get to exchange our sin 
For the, for the pronouncement of what? Forgiveness. It's a miracle. Every time. Every time. So, Old Testament, word and sign. New Testament, what? Word and sacrament. Same thing. And then there it just talks about the dynamic duo that God puts together with Moses and Aaron. And Aaron goes in for support, and chapter 5, verse 1 starts this way. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Look at verse 2. I hope, you, I hope you can hear the disdain with which Pharaoh asks this question. Who is Yahweh? Big stinking deal. That's Pharaoh's attitude. Why? Because everybody's got a God. All the cultures around Israel, they all have many gods, don't they? Egypt has many gods. And their principal God is who? Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh just says to Moses and Aaron, <laughs> Who's Yahweh? Like, big deal. He's, he's, just, he's, just, he's just the tribal God of you little flea-bitten Hebrews. Who is he? Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Who owns Israel, after all? That's the question, isn't it, still? I do not know Yahweh, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. How would you like to have received the challenge that Moses and Aaron received? <laughs> hey, go to, go to the most powerful person in the world and tell him to let go of his grip on all of his economic strength because that's what the Hebrews were, weren't they? Mm -hmm. They were his slaves and they were his economic strength. He's like, no way am I going to let that go. I just, I just thought this week as I was looking at this, if God had ever said that to me, I would have said, I don't think so. <laughs> but you know what? You and I are charged, aren't we, by the Lord? If you were in, if you were in 8 o'clock, you heard Pastor talk about that. You and I have responsibility to proclaim the Savior, don't we? And it's not like, it's not to be taken like law, like you're being beaten over the back. No, it's a pleasure to announce Christ to the world. And that's really, even back in Moses' day, that's the mission, isn't it? That's the mission. I said there in number one on your outline, the tougher task. He's got to face Pharaoh. But then Pharaoh goes on a little bit and he says, you know, you guys are just lazy, right? That's what he says down in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Tells him, you're going to continue your brick construction, but you're not going to get any straw from us. And your capacity to build bricks must not, must not deplete by a single brick. So you've got to go out and gather your own straw every day. That was being done for them up to that point. Verse 8, the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them, he says to the taskmasters. You shall by no means reduce it, for they, the Hebrews, are what? Idle. They're lazy. Were they? Mm -mm. He says they're idle. Therefore, they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. We want a vacation. <laughs> let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. And then look at verse 17. He says that again. He says that to the people of Israel who are now going to him themselves and complaining. It's not our fault we can't make the quota. You've taken away the means by which we can do it. And what does he accuse them of there? You're idle. 
you're lazy. They don't really have a friendly face to go to, do they? So there's some pushback. I put that in your outline too. And it comes from Moses. And Moses isn't happy with the Lord. Look <laughs> at what Moses says in verse 22. Moses turned to Yahweh and said, and I want you to catch this, because here's where you see the distinction. In verse 22, it says, Moses turned to Yahweh and said to him what? O Lord. That's the other word for Lord. That's Adonai. Master. That's where you see the distinction. He addresses him with his personal name, doesn't he? O Yahweh. <laughs> And then he says, oh, what? Master. So Moses gets it. But he says, oh, master, why have you done evil to this people? Moses is accusing the Lord. Question, have you ever accused the Lord? I have. not proud of it but when certain things haven't gone my way or when things have taken too long you're going to get a good lesson on patience this morning in the sermon <laughs> think pumpkins <laughs> <laughs> why have you done evil to this people why did you ever send me have you ever felt that way when the Lord gives you a task and you get in the middle of it and you're like, this is not going to end well. <laughs> I can just tell now. He's so good to us though because he sends us on tasks that force us to do what? Look up. If you're doing everything that you can do and, and, and God never comes into the equation in your tasks for the kingdom, you're not doing his work. Andy reminds us that all the time at Leadership Board. If we're only doing the things that we can do in our own strength, forget it. That's not kingdom work. That's part of it. But if we're never sweating a little bit, because things seem a little bit out of our reach, we're not depending on the Lord, are we? If I can accomplish it, what do I need him for? Why'd you ever send me? Verse 23. For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And look at this last part of the complaint. You have not delivered your people at all. <laughs> oh my God. Can you imagine saying that? To the king of the universe, you haven't done your part. <laughs> Mo, settle down, buddy. <laughs> what a scary thing. You know, sometimes, sometimes we just read the Bible too fast. Sometimes we just read the Bible too fast. We go over stuff and we don't take it in. Man, oh man, what are you saying to God here? <laughs> Lord, you just don't get it. I've said that to the Lord too. Is it two summers, Pastor? Two summers or three summers now back when Noah was going through all of his OCD stuff? Two? Three summers. Worst four months of our life when our youngest son was in a spiral from his OCD and it lasted four months. And I had it several times where I turned to the Lord and said, you just don't get this, do you? It's hard. It's hard. But Noah, who hasn't come back to regular worship yet, keeps asking questions. 
And he asked me the other day if I had a Bible he could use. Me. I got 68 Bibles. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he knows. I mean, he grabbed one off the shelf at home, but he just he came to me and said, Dad, you got you have a Bible that, that you would that you would recommend for me. That's not a hard thing, especially for your children. Yeah, right? Especially for your children. God knows what he's doing. But here it doesn't look like it, does it? Not to Moses. And I'm sure Aaron's kind of going, man, oh man, what did you get me into, you know? But then I hope you back up a little bit and you say to yourself, what is, what is proclaiming the gospel in my life? What is taking the good news of God to the world? What does it cost me in my life? Does it cost your family? Friends? A job? Sometimes the devil just whispers to us, doesn't he? You're no good at this. Just give it up. And that's paying a price too. Because it's that battle, isn't it? What does Paul say in Ephesians 6? Our enemies are not flesh and blood. When you're looking at another person, that's never your enemy. Hard today in a world that's so divisive, isn't it? To not look at another person and say, you're the problem. But what does Paul say? Nope. Nope. It is not the person. The person may be a tool of our real enemy, but it's not the person. And that's why Jesus says to us what? Love your enemies. Loving your neighbors. Cake. But loving your enemy? Take, what, what, what does it mean to love your enemy? The same thing it means to love your friends, which is to want the very best for them, whatever it costs you. That's, that's, that's love in the New Testament. Not a warm fuzzy. Not, you know, let's go make out in the back seat. No, that's not it. <laughs> that's what the world thinks, isn't it? And you notice how the world uses love in a way that they can just come and go with it? We were at a wedding reception last night, and there was a slow dance, and they had all the married couples get up there. And we got up there, and they pared us down by, okay, if you've been married a year or less, get off the dance floor, blah, blah, blah. You know. Kim and I made it to the last three couples on the floor. And I looked at her, and I said, we are old. <laughs> But, but you, know, you know what else? You know what else went through my heart last night? In a good way. I am so proud. I am so proud. Perfect marriage? Nope. Nope. Bumps? Yep. Angry words? Yep. Forgiveness offered? Yep. But standing out there with that beautiful woman last night on that dance floor... And seeing two other couples, and God bless them. I was proud. 42. The average marriage in America today lasts five years. That's it. It's okay to love bananas, but just not in that way. <laughs> but you're right, you're absolutely, that's, it, that's the point. What, what, what in the sanctuary do you look at when you want to see an exhibition of love? What do you look at in the sanctuary? The cross. Always. Pastor said that at the wedding yesterday to this new couple. If you want to see love, and, and, and Brian Boyle had built this beautiful cross for Maria. He said, if you want to see love, that, that's where you look. And what does, it, what, does it, what does it show? Sacrifice. To what point? Life. We 
better get going here. <laughs> Chapter 6. Yahweh said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. You notice God doesn't have any doubts about it? This is going to happen. That's the last point on your outline, actually, but we'll get there. But number two is a rebuke and a reminder. God spoke to Moses. <laughs> I love this part. I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Progressive revelation. There's good stuff for your theology class. God doesn't reveal himself to his people all at once. And I would imagine you and I are going to find out things about the Lord when we get home that we don't know now. Eternity will be progressive and it will be a place to grow. It will not be static. You and I will be taking in our Lord for eternity. And we'll never catch up. We'll never catch up with him. He'll just keep... He's a diamond and he just keeps turning himself and the light hits him and a little shot goes off and a new facet of light is shown and we get to take that in and bow down and worship him afresh because he's going to be revealing himself over and over and over. He goes on and he says this, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. So therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. Do you notice where God's people are in that passage? The only thing that God's people do in that passage are receive. That's it. Why? Because God does all the work. In theology, we call that monergism. God does all the work. One of the glorious, honestly, it's one of the glorious elements of Lutheran doctrine, monergism. Because so much of the rest of the Christian world sees it as a little bit of God's work and a little bit of mine thrown in to, to bring it up to snuff. It's what, a lot, it's what a lot of the church believes. That's called synergism because it's a joining of efforts. Salvation doesn't work that way. My Bible, how about yours? My Bible says salvation is from Yahweh. Doesn't say my salvation is from me and Lynette gets to throw a little in for hers too. Doesn't say that. But look at that passage. I, 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 I. Do you think God's committed to us? I had a pastor in Oregon years ago that used to say, you know, it, it, it's, it's a good thing to say I have commitment to the Lord. That's a healthy thing. It's a good thing. But what's even better is to remember what? His commitment to me. And, and answer me this. Doesn't his commitment to you and me far outweigh our commitments to him? We fail all the time, don't we? We fail all the time. He never fails in his commitment. That's one of the things he's trying to get across to Moses right here. Even at the beginning. No plagues yet, right? No Red Sea yet. We haven't even seen that. But Yahweh owns Israel, and he wants to teach them that, and he is. I've done this for you. I've done this for you. I've done that. You, you, didn't, have, you didn't have one spot in it. I've done it all. Jesus is hanging on the cross. 
on that blessed afternoon. And after he gets done forgiving the people who are murdering him, right? Does he do that? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. After he forgives them, what does he say? It is finished. Doesn't take, doesn't take your effort and mine to somehow pick up the slack. <laughs> it is finished. For who? Everybody. Everybody that you and I lock eyes on in our life, it's applied to them. They just need to know it. Their sins are forgiven. The tragedy is there's a world of people walking around the planet whose sins are forgiven and they don't even know it. That's what the preaching of the gospel is. So when you think about the Lord... Do you think of somebody that needs a little help with salvation? Or do you think he's got it well in hand? Look, look at the quote up here. Can you all see this? A.W. Tozer is one of my favorite pastors to read. He's not Lutheran, but man, he's one of the greats. He has a third, had a third grade education and used to go down into his furnace room in his home when he, was a, when he was a young convert to Christianity. And because he realized he was lacking so much in his education, he would get on his knees and ask the Lord to teach him how to understand Shakespeare. And when you read his writings, it's like, holy mackerel. <laughs> this, how, how old are we when we're in third grade? Eight, nine, maybe? That's when his formal education ended. He pastored the great Moody Church in Chicago and the Southside Alliance Church in Chicago and then ended his career in Toronto. Marvelous preacher of the gospel. But it says, I can't even see it all the way. It says, what comes into our minds when we hear the word God is the most important thing about us. And a great thought. It's challenging isn't it? Because you and I are always being challenged by the text of Scripture to think about God exactly the way he presents himself. And when you have the world, the flesh, and the devil working against you every moment that you breathe, it's hard to keep that right. And the failure at that is called what? Idolatry. When you and I make of God something that he is not, we're idolaters. When we make God in our image, we are what? Idolaters. And we all do it. When we think God needs help, we're committing idolatry. He doesn't need any help. Now, he loves us and he yearns for our fellowship and he desires to spend eternity with us. But he doesn't need our help. He loves to hear our praise. He loves to entertain our prayers. He loves to answer them. He loves to watch us raise our children. He loves to feed us his body and blood. And he loves to baptize babies and people of every other age group into his kingdom. We don't need our help. But that's why, that's where praise and worship come from because of the kind of God that we have. This is a, this is a good thought to keep, keep in mind every so often. You have the name above all names in Yahweh. So important. So important to hold on to that. That grand monologue that God just gave in chapter 6 about all the things that he does and he alone. So important. So important. Just because he does it all does not mean he doesn't want us around. He, he's given everything to ensure that we are around, right? And then I, then I quoted their Proverbs 18.10. Let's all read that together. 
The name of Yahweh is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. It's a great thing to call on the name of the Lord, isn't it? One of my favorite prayers in the Bible is four letters long in English. Remember when Peter was challenged to meet with his Lord on the water? And he says, come on out. And, and Peter, says, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out. And the Lord says, okay. <laughs> and, and, and the fishing boats in New Testament times were high-sided vessels. So Peter would have had to make a real leap to get out of the boat. He didn't just step out. He had to jump out. What happens to you when you jump out of a boat? <laughs> blub, 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 blub. Right? <laughs> Peter jumps out of the boat and <laughs> his feet hit the water and what? He's standing up. And he's fine for a little while until he looks at the waves and sees the churning of the water and he takes his eyes off of his Savior. What a great lesson. <laughs> What a great lesson. He takes his eyes off of his Savior, and what begins to happen? And Jesus just lets him go. Does he? No. Jesus gives Peter the wherewithal to say, help. <laughs> great prayer. Effective prayer. You ever used it? Help. <laughs> he hears that one. He responds to that one. And what do you see as a result? Peter says, help, and the Lord's arm comes down and grabs his hand and pulls him back up, and they get in the boat and go on their way. Pretty amazing. The name of Yahweh, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus is a strong tower, right? The righteous run to it, and they are what? Safe. Is the world a safe place today? It's going to get unsafer. It's going to. You can bet on it. Where are you going to run? Not to your gun cabinet, okay? Let's not do that. <laughs> I mean, hopefully it won't come to that. The righteous run to the name of the Lord, and they are what? Safe. What's the pushback here? Verse 9. <laughs> here comes Mo. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. It's not really Moses' problem here. It's the people, isn't it? And, and in some regards, you can't blame them. They've been under heavy taskmasters, haven't they? So you can't really blame them. Number three, and I'm just going to run through this. And this is just me. This isn't Dr. Lessing out of his book. This is just something that I picked up on the other day. But I, I, I think it's accurate. If you look at chapter 6 in verse 14, you have one of these wonderful lists of names. Remember when he said a little bit ago, God's deliverance is going to happen. It's going to happen, right? It's done deal. He knows it. Moses is figuring it out still, but God knows. But I, 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 even though it's just a genealogy, and it's, you shouldn't say that really, I guess, because it's God's word. But I'm going to read through this quick, because I want you to just hear the names and think about the fact that God has just given us a list of people. These are the heads of their fathers' houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the clans of Reuben, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Sheol, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the clans of Simeon. Now, whenever you get a list of the Old Testament 12 tribes, those two brothers come first because they're the two oldest, right? Verse 16, these are the names of the sons of Levi, and that fits too, because he's number three in the order. 
the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations, Gershon, Kohath, Merari, the years of the life of Levi being 137 years. Now, he doesn't go on to the next of the 12 brothers. He gets stuck in Levi's clan. The rest of the names are in Levi's family. He doesn't go on to the other 12 tribes of Israel. Wonder why. The sons of Gershon are Libni and Shimei by their clans. The sons of Kohath are Amram, Itzar, Hebron, and Uziel. The years of the life of Kohath being 133 years. The sons of Merari, Mali, and Mushi. I love that name. Can you imagine looking at a new baby? This is our, this is our son, Mushi. <laughs> or Mushi. <laughs> no, that's what the baby produces. <laughs> Okay, these are the clans of the Levites according to their generations. Amram took as his wife Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, the years of the life of Amram being 137 years. The sons of Itzar, Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel are Mishael, Elzaphan, and Sithri. Aaron took his wife, Elisheba, the daughter of Amminadab and the sister of Nashon, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, the sons of Korah, Aser, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These are the clans of the Korahites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took as his wife one of the daughters of Puchel, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites by their clan. Why did he get stuck in the Levite clan? What's the vocation of being a Levite? Primarily a priest, right? That's where all the priests came from under the Old Covenant. You and I have a high priest. His name is Jesus, and he doesn't come from the Levite clan. Right? Hebrews tells us he comes from Judah. But... But this is Old Testament. The workers of the temple and the, 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 the priests that offered sacrifice for the people. Here's why I think Moses got stuck on the clan of Levi here. Because the Levites are the tribe that give God's people access to him. Right? What is priesthood? It's standing in between, isn't it? It's standing, if you're a priest of God, you stand in between the people and the Lord, right? Pastors fulfill that role, too. It's an intermediary, isn't it? And the people in Levi's clan were the ones that were tasked the job to make sure that God's people always had access to him. When Jesus died on the cross, do you remember what happened in the temple? The curtain that separated the rest of the temple from the holiest place was ripped in two. And have you ever noticed it was ripped what direction? Top to bottom. Signifying what? The way is open, Hebrew says. The way is open. Jesus, the great high priest, had done the work of securing access, hadn't he? For all time, for all people. But in the old, under the Old Covenant, the Levites were the ones that gave God's people their access to him. And in order for him to deliver them, they must have constant access to him. And I think that's why Moses gives highlight to the tribe here. I think that's why he does it. God owns Israel. And their deliverance is going to happen. It's going to come through all the means and methods he gives under the Old Covenant, including temple sacrifice, including all of that stuff going on, the shedding of animals' blood and all of that. It's part of it. It's part of it. But God owns Israel. He's making a way for them. And he's already started. It's not full yet. We've got a lot to go in Exodus. But if God's people have access, if you and I have access to our Lord constantly, and we do, what do you have to fear? Nothing. Easy to say, tougher to live out, but 
It's the, it's the truth, isn't it? If you and I have access, constant access now through the blood of our Savior, what do we have to fear? Nothing. You and I marvel, and rightly so, at our brothers and sisters who live in persecuted countries where people are put to death or imprisoned for their faith. And, and very often, I've said it, and I've heard other people say it, man, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could live under that kind of a system. Yes, you could. Why? Because you and I have the same God that they have. And they don't make it by their strength. They don't go to be burned at the stake because of their strength. They don't go on a beach and lose their head at the acts of, an, of, a, of a radical Muslim because of their strength. They give their life in whose strength? His. And why do they have it? Because they have access to it. And so do you. And so do I. God will deliver his people. And you and I have a deliverance coming too, don't we? I've been thinking a lot about Evelyn lately. <laughs> How could you not? I think about when she was out at, out at the assisted living place out at Lloyd Ganton where I go to teach on Thursdays and she, she drew her last breath last week. When she closed her eyes here, as Dr. Mitchell used to say at the sem, when you close your eyes here, you say, good night, world, and good morning, glory. <laughs> Great way to think of it, isn't it? Now, she hasn't experienced her physical final resurrection yet, but she's in the presence of the Lord. How do we know? Because Paul says to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Imagine what she's, imagine what she's already experienced being in the near presence of Christ. Gives me goosebumps. <laughs> That's where you and I are headed. We have a great deliverance coming. Amen? How's your priestly vocation going? That's the last thing I want you to see on your outline. Because in 1 Peter chapter 2, you and I as the church are called a priesthood, a royal priesthood. So what kind of priesthood do you have? Thankfully, I'm really thankful, we don't have to slice up a bunch of animals and sprinkle their blood because it was a mess. If you want a good study sometime, dig into the, the priestly vocations in the Old Testament. And it's, ooh, it's messy. You and I don't do that. What does the New Testament say about our sacrifices? It's the sacrifice of praise from lips that honor his name. That's my role as a priest now to speak about the greatness and the excellence of Christ in front of people who don't know him yet. That's my role as a priest. My role as a priest is also to take my family and your families to the Lord in prayer every day. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're doing that. Because all the pronouns there are what? Plural. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespass. We're praying for each other. You and I have a priestly vocation, but it's a priesthood of praise and thanksgiving and proclamation of the excellence of Christ. What a job, right? Like Peggy always says, we get to do this. It's not that we have to do this. We get to do it, amen? So how's your priestly vocation going? Let, let's all take that as priests and priestesses of the Most High God. This week, let me challenge you this way. As you go on and read in Exodus, and you see the revelation of God become clearer and clearer to his people, think about the responsibility you and I have. I fail at it a lot. I do. But like the catechism says, when you go to confess your sins, you go to your confessor and at the end you say, I want to do better. I want to do better. I want to be a better priest. I want to be a better proclaimer of the excellencies of Christ. Amen? Let's help each other. It's not a competition. 
It's not pastor's got the pastor's got the collar so he can do it and we just kind of come along on, underneath it. No, 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 no. This is not a competition. We're in the same family. He's got a special role. Praise God, he plays it so well, right? But we're all in this. Let's help each other, amen? Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for Moses and Aaron and for all the people in this lineage that you've named before us and all the family of God that has gone before us, who is our family, Moses and the whole gang, that's our family. Abraham is our father in the faith. This is family. Help us, Lord, to help each other through this week to live out our priesthood of proclaiming your excellency to the world. Help us to do it individually. Help us to do it with our spouses and our children. Help us to do it together as a congregation. And Lord, we ask you a special blessing for tomorrow. That as people are gathered here to honor Evelyn Jones, that you'd give pastor the power and the grace to clearly proclaim the gospel of Christ so that his excellent name would be heard by many, many who perhaps never darken the door of a church. We ask that trusting in your mercy through Christ our Lord. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Love y'all. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.